right, we'll get started in just about one more minute here. And just going through some of the basic information. Switch to our CME slide. So in case anybody wants to get CME for today's course, please go ahead and scan this QR code. And again, we'll get started in about 30 seconds here. All right, looks like we've reached, reached a critical mass. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Bellinghausen and I'm one of the pulmonary critical care docs at University of California, San Diego. I am really privileged to be a guest moderator for the ATS Critical Care Training Forum. Thank you to Dr. Laura Crotty Alexander for inviting me. Today we're gonna to be talking about the post ICU care of COVID patients. So um, this is something that a lot of folks are just learning about, a lot of folks have been passionate about, but unfortunately, the more we're seeing young, healthy people in the ICU, the more we're seeing some of its complications. And we wanted to talk about that and answer some questions today. So uh, just going through the outline, we have three fabulous presenters here. We're gonna mix up the order a little bit because Dr. Brad Butcher has been kind enough to join us from what sounds like the night shift from hell. Um, so Brad Butcher, Kristen Schwab, and Nina Kadir will be joining us. I'll talk a little bit more about them on each section. Um, these are our disclosures and uh, you can read them here. These are our educational objectives. Feel free to read through this. This is also available on the website. And I'll pause on this slide again one more time. If you do want CME credit, please scan this QR code and complete the evaluation. So these are some additional sessions that are available through the ATS website and some of the other topics that we've gone over. If you wanna go through our previous critical care training forum episodes, you can find those on the ATS website. It's here, or you can just search for ATS COVID forum. Some upcoming topics include resuscitation, post COVID lung disease, COVID in patients with HIV and patients uh, COVID-19 in lung transplant. This is our team, fabulous ATS staff uh, and CCTF uh, chairs, including, like I said, Dr. Prady Alexander, Dr. Shaw, Cribs, and Call, and then our fabulous team of trainees, mostly here at UCSD. All right, so once again, I'm Amy Bellinghausen, and we're gonna be talking about the post-ICU care of COVID-19 patients. And I'm gonna briefly jump ahead All right, so Dr. Brad Butcher is joining us uh, from UPMC Mercy Hospital. Again, he is a braver soul than me being on an actual night shift. He has agreed to uh, talk to us a little bit today about some of the challenges of operating an ICU recovery clinic during a global pandemic. He did his internal medicine residency at Mass General and then did fellowship at uh, UCSF and then has been working at UPMC Mercy Hospital where he is the leader of the ICU recovery clinic there. He's done a lot of research uh, into post-intensive care syndrome, and I must say has been help, one of the people that's helped contribute to UCSD getting started with our own program. So with that, um, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on a couple cases and just get your thoughts on the approach that you might take to these COVID patients coming into an ICU recovery. Sure. Okay. So, good evening, everybody, by the way. 
Um, as Amy said, I am on a night shift at the moment, and it's been a particularly busy evening. So if I happen to disappear, I apologize in advance, but hopefully we'll be able um, to get through this session. Amy was kind enough to develop a couple of cases. I'm essentially seeing them for the first time along with you. So this is going to be a bit of an extemporaneous thinking off the top of my head, how would I, how I would approach um, patients that I might be seeing in my own ICU recovery clinic. I'll try not to do too many of the uh, unknown case gotchas. <laughs> and right. I'd, like, I'd like to be this as interactive as possible so people feel free to ask questions. I think that's probably where the majority of the learning will occur. All right, great. So these are based on folks that we've seen or heard of, not any one particular patient, but definitely representative of some of the cases we've been seeing. So case one. 46-year-old male, history of diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and obesity. Um, it was admitted to the ICU for about two weeks with COVID-19-associated ARDS. Treated the way we all do, on the ventilator for 10 days, was prone for four sessions, 16, 18 and eight hours each, 18 and six, excuse me, um, was given paralytics for about 48 hours to help with the synchrony. His course in the ICU was complicated by distributive shock, which he had central line and arterial line placement, of course, and a left-sided pneumothorax, which was treated with a pigtail chest tube. Once he was extubated and oxygen requirement was decreased, he was transferred to the floor, discharged home six days later. So a total hospital stay of roughly 20 days. He's presenting to evaluation for your ICU recovery clinic for about a one month follow up. And when you ask him what he's concerned about, he says that the main thing for him is weakness. He's having a lot of trouble getting up from a chair. So with that, any additional questions that you would ask and any in office testing or screening that would come to mind. So the first thing that I think about when listening to this case is that I'm actually pleasantly surprised that the patient was able to be discharged home rather than to a skilled nursing facility. So that's already a bit of a win because most patients who come in with this severe ARDS that requires proning and paralysis and 10 days of mechanical ventilation often are not discharged home. So that's a bit of a win for the patient, but clearly he is not back to his pre-morbid condition. Um, and there are a lot of things that we could likely address in a post-intensive care unit clinic. His main concern is weakness. That's not surprising. As I'm sure all of you are aware, um, bed rest is the um, most likely predictive factor for developing ICU required weakness. And for each day someone stays in bed, um, they lose approximately eight to 12% of their muscle strength. So having been mechanically ventilated for 10 days, prone for four of them, so clearly he was not getting early mobility during that time and paralyzed for at least two of them, it, makes a lot of sense that the patient is likely suffering some degree of ICU acquired weakness. Um, the weakness could also be added to by other factors. Perhaps he is nutritionally deficient. So that's something that we're going to want to ask about in a post-intensive care unit clinic. Um, and the weakness may be manifestations of other things like cognitive dysfunction or psychiatric dysfunction as well. Having been mechanically ventilated for 10 days and paralyzed for at least two of them, we know that he likely required a significant amount of sedation to maintain ventilator synchrony and to ensure that he was not aware of the fact that he was paralyzed. So that degree of sedation um, puts him at risk for developing cognitive dysfunction. We don't know based on the vignette that we've been presented with whether or not the patient was delirious during his intensive care unit stay, but that would be a really important question to go back and take a look through the chart and see if the patient was found to be delirious because as we know, delirium increases the risk of long-term cognitive dysfunction in these patients. Um, and certainly a patient's mood can impact their physical health as well. So it would be important to screen him for depression, anxiety, and PTSD. This is particularly true in the era of COVID given the visitor limitation uh, to the hospital. So it's unlikely that he had been able to interact with any of his loved ones during his hospitalization, which we are inclined to believe would increase the, the risk of developing depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder in him and in his family members as well. Remember that PICS um, doesn't just affect the person who was hospitalized, but also the loved ones and family members who may develop the psychiatric sequelae of, of PICS as well. Um, so what are some of the in-office tests and screening procedures that I would do? 
Um, first of all, I would have him evaluated by a pharmacist just to reconcile his medications to ensure that medications that are often given in the intensive care unit and are often not discontinued at the time of ICU transfer or hospital discharge are reconciled to make sure he's no longer requiring a H2 receptor antagonist or a proton pump inhibitor. Had he gotten medications for delirium in the ICU, we want to make sure that those medications are discontinued. Um, if possible, if a respiratory therapist is available or a spirometry is available, I would do a quick spirometric study for him. We know that patients with ARDS often have some degree of lung dysfunction immediately after their discharge, but usually by six months to one year, um, those deficits resolve. Obviously, if his main concern is weakness, um, we want to further evaluate that. So if a physical therapist is available, you could put them through a number um, of screening tools. In our particular clinic, we use the six-minute walk test as a marker of exercise capacity and endurance. Um, he's having trouble getting up from a chair. And in that particular case, we can use a test called the five times sit to stand, which is a marker of um, proximal muscle strength. We also do a gait speed assessment. Gait speed, you don't often think about that as a particularly helpful marker, but gait speed correlates with fall risk, mortality, and risk of being readmitted to the hospital. So that's actually something very important to take a look at. Um, and a balance assessment as well. We know that he's weak, but how is that really impacting his life? And so in order to better assess that, we could screen him with some questionnaires to determine um, his independence and in activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So for those who aren't familiar, activities of daily living, which are often assessed by using something called a CATS questionnaire, um, are those things that we typically take for granted that we do without any thinking, um, such as bathing ourselves, feeding ourselves, getting dressed, transferring, and toileting. Instrumental activities of daily living are slightly more complicated tasks that, in addition to requiring physical skill, re require some degree of cognitive input as well. And those are things such as uh, preparing a meal for oneself, performing housework, going grocery shopping, navigating one's finances and medications, things like that. Cognitively, as I said, we would like to get a better sense of what his cognitive function is. And in our clinic and in most clinics across the country, we use the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool, uh, which assesses a number of domains of cognitive function, including visual, spatial, and executive functioning, orientation, recall, um, attention, and language processing skills. And then I would screen him for depression, anxiety, and the post-traumatic stress disorder. There are a handful of questionnaires that are validated um, that can be used. We tend to use the HADS, which is the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Screen for anxiety and depression, of course. And we've been through several PTSD screens, and we've landed on the IES-6 um, because it's the simplest and quickest one to do, and it's just as valid as the more complicated, lengthier assessments. I think realistically, at a minimum, he's probably going to require a referral to outpatient physical therapy. And I would suspect by virtue of having trouble getting up from a chair that a lot of his activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living will be compromised. So he would probably benefit from an occupational therapy referral as well. So it sounds like really um, thorough evaluation, not just of his initial complaint or his pulmonary complaint, but all the things that can contribute to weakness, including psychiatric conditions, nutrition you mentioned, um, specific focal areas of weakness or global weakness. Yeah. Um, how is this different than you would manage, say, a flu ARDS? Is there any difference that you would say? So that's an excellent question. And the answer is no. Um, the t you know, the the topic of this talk is managing a post-ICU clinic in the era of COVID, but realistically, it could be called managing a post-ICU clinic in general because the approach to a COVID-19 patient is really not fundamentally different than the approach to a non-COVID-19 patient, other than the fact that for many months of the year, all of these evaluations had to be done via telemedicine. I'm sure many of you across the country had many of your outpatient clinics closed down for a long period of time, and you had to rapidly learn how to hold a visit via the telephone or via teleconferencing software. And in our clinic, we had to do the same thing. The, the way that the valuation is different is that in my clinic, I typically have a cadre of professionals evaluating each of these specific areas. So we usually have about eight to 10 people evaluating each of these patients who are rotating throughout the room. When you're doing a telemedicine visit, you don't have all that expertise available to you. It's simply you and the patient. So 
the expertise is limited to the one provider who's typically the physician in our case, um, who has you know, knowledge of occupational therapy and physical therapy, but probably can't elicit the same degree of detail and insight that an occupational therapist or a physical therapist would. Mm -hmm. Similarly, because you're doing the evaluation via the telephone or via video conferencing, the evaluations that typically rely on an in-person interaction cannot be done, and you have to think of an alternative way to do those things. For example, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool requires some degree of in-person evaluation to draw a cube and to draw the face of a clock, for example. So in order to do that telephonically, you have to switch to the Mocha Blind, for example, which is a slightly shorter version of the questionnaire, but still um, yields interesting information that's actionable. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't do a six-minute walk test or a spirometric evaluation or a five-time sit-to-stand or assess their balance. So in this case, we used um, a questionnaire that's sort of based off the AMPAC screening that our ICU nurses do at the time of ICU admission to ask about basic mobility tasks and whether the patient is capable of achieving those on their own. Mm -hmm. That's in the Lawton questionnaires for activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living can be done telephonically. So those are relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. And although it's a bit painful, it is possible to screen patients for depression, anxiety, and PTSD via the telephone as well. Mm -hmm. So some of the evaluations has to be changed, but by and large, you can still collect a reasonable amount of high quality information that you can make solid clinical decisions and therapy referrals on. Okay. Um, absolutely more challenging. I'm going to have you go over one more case and then uh, I'll just ha have you answer a couple of questions that are coming up in the chat. For sure. So second case, again, not unrepresentative of some of the patients that we've been seeing. A 27-year-old female, previously healthy, was admitted to the ICU for four weeks for COVID-19-associated ARDS, 14 days on ECMO, status post-tracheostomy. Uh, you mentioned for the previous patient, you were pleased to see they didn't go to an LPAC. She did. Uh, went to a long-term acute care hospital for four weeks is decannulated from her tracheostomy after three weeks, and she's currently staying with her parents plus her two children. Um, her main concern coming into clinic is that she's too tired and too short of breath to play with and take care of her kids. And what are some of the things that you would look for specifically in this patient that might be different from a patient who is complaining more of weakness? So a similar sort of approach, to be perfectly honest with you. I think probably the biggest complaint that we have um, in our post-ICU clinic is that patients are tired. Um, and we will ask them that subjectively. We also have, have them fill out a symptom-based questionnaire, and almost everybody scores themselves very high on not having enough energy to accomplish their daily tasks or not being able to fulfill the roles that they did before they were sick simply because they don't have enough energy. That's often accompanied by sleep disturbances, which can contribute to their tiredness. As we mentioned in the previous vignette, cognitive dysfunction and psychiatric dysfunction can also contribute to tiredness. Um, and it's not unexpected, right? If any of us had gone through a hospitalization like that, despite our previous level of fitness, many of us would be tired. And so in our particular clinic, we don't do a lot of laboratory or radiological evaluations of people. Um, it may be worth doing in this particular case, depending on what happened during her hospitalization. If she was anemic, for example, is her anemia improving? If she had renal failures, the renal failure improving, those sorts of medical conditions, of course, could contribute to tiredness in certain patient populations. Um, but I don't honestly think the general approach would be any different than the person that we saw in the first case. I think what I've learned ever after having done this for a little over two years is that the benefit of having an ICU follow-up clinic is the luxury of time in many cases. Our visits often take two to three hours um, and we're able to elicit a huge amount of information from the patient, far more than could be elicited in a 15 to 30 minute primary care physician follow-up appointment. And because of that, we're really able to tackle all the aspects of their recovery. We like to say we provide a holistic approach to patient care and think of them as a body, a mind, and a spirit rather than simply an organ dysfunction or a symptom. And in this particular case, that symptom is a very protean one and could be there could be hundreds of causes of it. So you really need the luxury of time to sit down and talk with the patient and figure out exactly how that symptom is impacting their life. And then what we like to do in our clinic um, is have them set goals for themselves. Mm -hmm. And we'll ask them to set three goals for themselves over the next three months. And then we'll design a rehabilitation plan that will help them achieve those goals. So for example, if she says that she's too tired, 
and she cannot take care of her kids. So maybe one of her goals would be, I'd like to be able to be more independent in taking care of my kids. How can we achieve that goal? Well, you may need physical therapy for endurance training. You may need occupational therapy so you can learn how to pick your children up again if you've had shoulder dysfunction from having been proned in the bed, for example. Um, if it's a cognitive tiredness, like I just can't stay concentrated to play with them for 30 minutes, then maybe you need to go to cognitive therapy to work on concentration skills. If you're depressed and that's causing lethargy and some degree of apathy with playing with your children, then maybe you need some short-term psychotherapy to help you get through that. So again, people are going to come in with some very protein complaints and very vague symptoms. And your job as the post-ICU clinician and your team's job is to really dig deep and get past the superficial layer and figure out how exactly are your problems impacting your life and what can we do to address those specific problems and get you back on the road to recovery as quickly as possible. Thank you. Um, a couple of the questions, uh, just specifically, which subspecialties do you have in your clinic? Perfect. Before it was telemedicine, which uh, subspecialty providers did patients see on each visit? Absolutely. So um, they're seen by a critical care pharmacist, a critical care respiratory therapist, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a speech language pathologist, an ICU dietitian, a social worker, a case manager if necessary, and then either myself, um, our nurse practitioner, or one of our second year fellows in critical care medicine. Fantastic. So, yeah, we really pride ourselves on being a truly multidisciplinary clinic. And basically we've taken the ICU team and then transplanted them into the outpatient setting essentially. So all the multidisciplinary care that's so important to us in the intensive care unit now gets transposed to the outpatient setting. That's great. Um, one other question is uh, a comment that other groups are doing six minute walk tests and some patients aren't even able to sit comfortably and having trouble to address the pain before addressing weakness. And the question was, how long have you been able to follow up these patients and have you noticed persistent weakness and what's the role of pain and arthralgias in that weakness? Yeah, so a very good question. Um, I too have had many patients come to the clinic who were not able to participate in a six minute walk test. We see patients who were discharged to skilled nursing facilities sometimes and sometimes they roll into the clinic on their stretcher and they don't get off the stretcher for the visit. Um, but if you follow them long enough, um, and in some cases up to 18 months for our patient population, you can get them to the point where they're able to walk um, and participate in in the test and then ultimately in outpatient therapy. So we've had a handful of patients who were completely non-ambulatory the first time that we saw them. And by the time they graduated the clinic, they were ambulatory and independent in their activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. But it is a labor of love and they really have to be motivated and want to improve. And they have to have some degree of resiliency too. I think that's what I found doing this for two years is that if patients have some resiliency and they are motivated to get better, then those are the patients who are going to achieve their goals. And those who aren't re as resilient and those who don't have a clear drive to get better often falter and plateau and don't achieve the goals that they set for themselves. Pain, of course, is a certainly an important component. Um, our nurse practitioner in the clinic has a lot of experience in palliative care. She used to be the inpatient palliative care nurse practitioner. So she has a lot of experience in pain management. So we're able to craft um, pain management strategies for patients if that is a big concern and or we can refer them to our chronic pain clinic as well if necessary. Um, just two other questions and I think we should get moving on to the next uh, presentation. Um, how many times do you see ICU survivors back in your clinic? Yeah, so it's variable. So we try to see patients within two weeks of hospital discharge, if at all possible. Realistically, that ends up being about two to four weeks within hospital discharge. Then we have set appointments at three months, six months, and 12 months. Occasionally, we will see people at nine months if at their six-month appointment, they still required a lot of rehabilitation prescriptions. And we've occasionally seen patients um, at 15 and 18 months, especially those who as I mentioned before, were completely non-ambulatory in their first couple of visits. They really couldn't benefit from the clinic initially, and it was more about establishing a relationship and beginning the education about what the post-intensive care syndrome is. Um, and sometimes patients graduate the clinics after their first visit or their second visit. Sometimes people need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think we should get going on to our next speaker, but thank you so much. Feel free to hang around if you want to answer some more questions in the chat or if you have time to answer questions at the I end. I think I have to go intubate somebody, but I do. I did want to make two <laughs> points if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. So um, there's a lot of media about these long haul COVID patients and is there something unique about COVID and the struggles that patients who have had COVID are dealing with? I think that's a really interesting question for debate and maybe something that you guys can talk about later on in this session. I don't have the answer to that question, obviously, but I think it's, it's one to really think about. Is there something unique about coronavirus that causes patients to have breathlessness and tiredness and cognitive dysfunction? Is it something about the patient's immune response to the virus that causes them to have those things? Or, and this is the opinion that I'm sort of leaning towards, is it really just the post-intensive care syndrome? I think it's also important to remember that post-intensive care syndrome is a term that was used to describe this phenomenon essentially so that everybody could work off one definition and perform research on it. But there's a post-hospitalization syndrome too for patients who didn't require intensive care, who may have had sepsis not bad enough to be in the ICU, but bad enough to have a prolonged inpatient hospitalization. And many of them, if you interview them, are tired and weak and have cognitive dysfunction and have mood disorders as a consequence of it. So is the long haul COVID phenomenon just sort of on the spectrum of PICS post hospitalization syndrome or is there something unique about COVID? And the other thing, I've been asked by a lot of reporters about my thoughts on recovering following COVID-19. And what I say is this, the post-intensive care syndrome has been around since critical care has been around. People didn't really think about it until about 10 to 15 years ago. And the nation as a whole didn't care about it until COVID-19 shone a light on it. So if there's any silver lining to the cloud of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's that people are now actually paying attention to what happens to someone after they've survived a profound critical illness. And for many people, surviving a critical illness is the first step on a journey of chronic disease. PICS is a chronic disease that changes over the course of time, which is why you need to reevaluate them frequently over the course of a post-ICU clinic. Um, and those are, I'll get off my soapbox now, but those are my two major points. I, I like your soapboxes. <laughs> May the uh, intubation go well. Thank you very much. And thank you, Amy, so much for um, inviting me to share in this forum. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I'm very passionate about this topic. And if anybody wants to reach out to me outside of this forum, please feel free to do so. You can find my email address on the internet. You can tweet me um, as well, and I'd be happy to talk to you. And if anybody's interested in starting a post-ICU clinic, I can give a lot of advice on that, too. So... And hi to Laura Crowdy, who I went to residency with and haven't seen since. So super excited <laughs> to see your name. All right, everybody, have a wonderful evening. And thank you again so much for letting me participate. Thank you. All right. So um, just would like to introduce uh, Kristen Schwab. She is one of the co-directors of the UCLA ICU Recovery Clinic. And she's going to talk a little bit about post-intensive care syndrome and COVID-19. She also did her internal medicine residency and fellowship at UCLA. So she's a Southern California person, just like myself. Um, and we're gonna take a little bit of a step back from some of the case-based and go over the basics of post-ICU syndrome and COVID-19. Feel free to keep asking questions in the chat and we will we'll try to answer them as we're able. All right, great. Hello everyone. And thank you so much, Amy, for having me. Um, so I am a faculty member at UCLA. Uh, I'm very excited to talk with all of you today about post-intensive care syndrome. As a bit of background, when I was a fellow, I helped to launch our post-ICU clinic at UCLA. And so now as a faculty member, this has been kind of my passion project. And I'm very excited to kind of share uh, what we've learned and um, hopefully impart some of that uh, interest in all of you guys here today as well. Um, so, you know, we've always known that ICU survivorship is important. This is very similar to echoing what uh, Dr. Butcher was just mentioning, but I think now more than ever, uh, ICU survivorship and recovery has really been at the forefront of uh, the public attention, both kind of the, the news media as well as the medical community. And, uh, and so now really is our time to kind of figure out how we can best treat these people. Um, to put a face to PICS, um, another face after kind of some of the, 
the good primers we got before. Uh, this is one patient we saw in our post-ICU clinic uh, recently. He's a 64-year-old, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He previously worked as a seafood distributor, and he presented to us in our clinic after being hospitalized with COVID and severe ARDS. He was intubated for about nine days, uh, was paralyzed and prone, and we saw him in clinic about a month after he was discharged to home. Um, and what he reported to us was significant anxiety and insomnia, saying that he lies awake all night with his mind racing, had actually seen uh, multiple other providers before us, had been prescribed four different sleeping pills, none of which had worked. Um, he also endorsed new ADL dependence, uh, saying that now he can't even bathe or transfer from a bed to a chair independently. And before this, as a seafood distributor, he was very physically active, now actually is considering retiring just because of the degree of his, uh, his physical disability. I want you guys to keep these two points in mind because they do uh, actually map to two of the three domains of post-intensive care syndrome that I'll be talking about. Um, otherwise, on review of systems, he also endorsed ongoing cough and shortness of breath. He also had some ongoing dysuria that seemed related to some bladder spasming after the Foley had been removed. Uh, also had some limited shoulder range of motion, likely adhesive capsulitis after being prone and paralyzed for some time. Um, and then we also actually found that he was inadvertently taking one and a half times the dose of his amlodipine and losartan, didn't realize on discharge that the new med was in place of and that in addition to his old uh, antihypertensive meds. He's also similarly on some uh, redundant inhalers. Now going to his objective uh, results in our clinic, we do many of the same kind of screening that Dr. Butcher had mentioned. Uh, we found that his six minute walk test was severely reduced. He was able to go actually less than 50 meters walking. And then his MOCA also uh, correlated with moderate cognitive impairments uh, with a score of 16 out of 30. Uh, here are three of uh, the, the drawings from his MOCA and you can see that his uh, trail making test is abnormal instead of going from two to B and three to C and so forth. Uh, he, he doesn't do that. Uh, his Cube draw isn't terrible, but also isn't uh, completely normal. And then you can see that clock draw um, is, is missing some of the numbers, eight and nine, also is missing the hands of the clock uh, and the time. And so, you know, with this cognitive dysfunction that's picked up on the MOCA, as well as the physical uh, disability with the decreased six minute walk, as well as his dependence in ADLs, and then also with that mental health that he uh, problems that he was endorsing. He actually meets all three of those domains of post-intensive care syndrome. So this is actually from the ARDS support page on Facebook, which as an aside, if anyone um, has extra time, it's very illuminating to kind of browse through uh, this and see what some of our ICU survivors are reporting. Um, I won't read all of this, but this is a patient who had multi-organ failure after a ruptured appendix. She says, I'm physically getting stronger every day, but the mental aspect is literally killing me. I'm an accountant, and at this point, I cannot return with my current impairments. I'm 49 years old and feel like my life is over. My PCP doesn't know about this, thinks that it's all PTSD. I'm so lost, not sure who to turn to or what kind of doctor I would see for this. So now going to ICU survivorship, uh, we do know that there's actually an increasing number of patients who survive critical illness. This is uh, a, a graph from a paper looking at ICU survivorship in the U.S. over time, and you can see that that black line, which is hospital mortality, has decreased over time, um, and that's actually despite the fact that that uh, blue line age as well as the red line acute physiology score or severity of illness have both increased over time. Now going to ARDS mortality, this has also improved over time. Uh, you can see this graph on the left from um, data in the, in the 1980s and beyond, and before that showing that there were mortality rates above 50% and seven, sometimes approaching 70%. You can see that now uh, that's improved significantly over time uh, with current mortality ranging in the mid-30s for mild ARDS to the mid-40s for severe ARDS.
I know, of course, for COVID mortality, uh, this is with much the caveat that there's very wide ranges and so much of this is, is still uh, being understood and changed kind of on a daily and weekly basis. But we do know that that COVID mortality seems to approximate that ARDS mortality for now, at least. Uh, there is substantial geographic and inner center variability, uh, which is outlined here in the graphs below. Um, and so 40% mortality is, is certainly significant, but it, you know, we also know now that with 60% or more of these patients surviving, so there's really more patients than ever who are going to need this post-ICU care. And of course, we're very, uh, we feel great about this increase in survivorship, but there is a cost to these ICU survivors when they leave the hospital. Um, there's significant medical and psychological sequelae, which I'll, men I'll talk about in future slides in more detail. Uh, there's also significant financial sequelae. I think uh, the second bullet point is particularly striking where almost a half of previously employed ARDS survivors are jobless at one year. Um, and, and so now these last two bullet points are from two of the leaders within the critical care community, really emphasizing again how important uh, this is for, for our community with uh, survivorship being the defining challenge of critical care in the 21st century and improving outcomes after critical illness being a mandate to the critical care community. So now what is post-intensive care syndrome or PICS? And so uh, this is a relatively new concept. It was developed in 2010 um, after a stakeholders conference with many of the kind of leaders in the field. And it's defined as new or worsened impairment in one or more of the following domains that, uh, that occurs after an ICU stay and persists after hospital discharge. And the three domains are cognition, mental health, and physical function. And so any one of these three uh, domains, if there's an impairment in it, it will qualify you as having post-intensive care syndrome. This is a visual um, corollary to that. And you can see that picks for patients uh, in that green boxes is, is really uh, characterized by an impairment in one of these three arms, mental health, cognitive impairment, or physical impairment, all of which are leading to decreased quality of life. Now, risk factors for PICS have been studied and are currently being studied uh, further as well. Um, a lot of these are not too surprising and correspond with severity of illness for people when they are in the ICU. Um, I think also what, what you can see when looking at this is that a lot of our COVID patients meet all of these criteria or almost all of these, uh, these risk factors, really suggesting that COVID patients are at particularly high risk for PICS development. Um, also the fact that steroids, which is one of our treatments for COVID patients is a risk factor I think is, is particularly striking. And, um, I put this reference on the right, uh, which is actually hot off the press from, uh, from this month in critical care medicine um, as kind of consensus guidelines on ways in the ICU uh, that we can predict and identify patients who may be at particularly high risk. And so something to delve into for those who are interested in this after the, after the talk. So now going one by one into these various domains, I'll start with physical impairment. Um, so this is a study from 2003, a landmark study that really helped define some of these outcomes in ARDS survivors. And, and so they evaluated these survivors uh, both based on kind of quality of life, as well as six minute walk and pulmonary function tests, as well as a few other assessments. And what they found is that the six minute walk tests for these patients uh, were decreased uh, with, uh, with a distance of 281 meters at three months. And though this did improve over time to 422 meters at 12 months, it still is not uh, within the normal range of what would be expected for people. Um, table two here on the right shows some of the pulmonary function test results. And what they found is that um, while spirometry and lung volumes actually normalized by six months, and actually if you look at total lung capacity being above 90% uh, throughout this time frame, I think is quite um, impressive in a way, they found that the DLCO remains low at 12 months. And I think um, this is some of the data we're using to kind of predict ways to screen many of our COVID patients going forward, um, suggesting that that DLCO may be the most sensitive to identify patients with, with any kind of residual lung impairments at um, these follow-up time intervals. When they surveyed these patients in the studies, the patients felt that 
their muscle weakness and fatigue were um, actually the cause of these functional limitations as opposed to shortness of breath or kind of pulmonary factors being the, the cause of their limitations. And so this as well as coupled with the fact that the spirometry and the lung volumes looked uh, relatively normal in these, in these patients really led these authors to conclude that these physical impairments in PICs are largely often due to extrapulmonary factors um, and has been kind of uh, accepted uh, for many of, uh, many of the experts kind of moving forward in terms of the, the cause of these physical impairments. And, and so we really use this term uh, ICU acquired weakness to, to kind of characterize and as the kind of the formal diagnosis uh, for many of these patients who have ongoing weakness after uh, an ICU stay. There's kind of two main flavors to this with critical illness myopathy and critical illness neuropathy uh, being the two. The critical illness myopathy is, is more common and generally has a bit more of a favorable prognosis uh, when compared to critical illness neuropathy. I'll now move into the cognitive impairment arm. I'll say that this is much more subtle and oftentimes I think the most underdiagnosed of all three of these because it does really necessitate um, a dedicated screen uh, with something like the MOCA, um, really addressing impairments in memory, attention, and executive functioning. So things that sometimes are a bit more subtle and won't be picked up unless you're specifically looking for them. This brain ICU study from 2013 really nicely delineates the, the degree of cognitive impairment in these patients. This looks at over 800 ICU patients um, who were hospitalized with respiratory failure or shock, and they assess these people with the repeatable battery for the assessment of neuropsychological status called the R-bands. And they assess them with this R-bands at three months and 12 months. And uh, what's particularly interesting kind of at baseline is just that very few patients actually had cognitive impairments uh, to begin with. And what they found um, was that um, in their follow-up intervals, the median global cognition score where 100 is normal and is shown as that green horizontal line. Um, at three months, the median global cognition score was 79. At 12 months, it was still low at 80. Um, you can see that this in these plots um, really was across the board for all age groups. And, and you can also see that at three months, almost half, 40% of these patients had scores similar to scores for patients with traumatic brain injury, which is that blue line that uh, extends across. And then almost a quarter, actually more than a quarter of them had scores similar to people with mild Alzheimer's. Uh, they also found that a longer duration of delirium was independently associated with worse cognition at 12 months. And so you can see here in this figure that um, increased days of delirium on that x-axis correlated with worsened scores on the y-axis. For the sake of time, I won't delve too deeply into the mental health uh, components, uh, though suffice it to say, these are a significant um, area of impairment for our survivors. And I think um, in the COVID era where there's a social isolation, uh, these we're seeing even more frequently than in other patients often. Um, also interestingly, uh, for post-intensive care syndrome family, which is another branch of PICS that, that's been described, uh, these mental health components really predominate for the family members uh, compared to the other two realms. Um, and actually are, are quite prevalent with a quarter to even up to a half of family members endorsing anxiety, depression, PTSD, or grief uh, following a loved one stay in the ICU, uh, really underscoring, I think, the importance of also um, addressing the caregiver's uh, mental health in these post-ICU visits when you can. In terms of how common PICS is in survivors, and so this was a study uh, that looked at adult patients who were discharged from five different ICUs and what they found is that 64%, so almost two thirds of patients at three months had an impairment in one of these three domains of PICS. Um, and this continued at 12 months to be about 56% of their patients. And you can see here with the overlapping Venn diagrams that um, both at three months, which is panel A, and at 12 months at panel B, there is a significant degree of co-occurring problems in many of these patients. 
So I think this is my last slide, uh, just as a summary. Um, PICS is very common and often underrecognized, particularly that uh, cognitive impairment arm. And COVID-19 survivors do seem to be at particularly high risk for this. Uh, and so because of this, I think improving outcomes for these survivors is a challenge, but also an imperative to our critical care community. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Amy. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I also included my email here as I would love to hear from anyone offline if there's any additional questions that, that come to mind after this talk. Thank you so much. I think that was a fantastic introduction to post-ICU syndrome. A couple questions in the chat. Um, how, any particular risk factors for post-ICU syndrome? Yeah, I, there, there's, this has been very well kind of, it's being studied more and more. Um, and actually that paper that I referenced from critical care medicine kind of goes into some of the, the various risk factors. Um, Pre-existing cognitive impairments, I think for the cognitive realm, um, delirium, sedating meds, um, all of those are kind of the biggest ones that come to mind. I think for the physical weakness, um, prolonged stay in the ICU, immobility, um, steroids, just because of the critical illness myopathy that those can cause are certainly risk factors. Um, and then in terms of mental health, I think um, there have been some studies suggesting that pre-existing mental health um, issues or kind of alcoholism, other, other health problems can, um, can in confer an increased risk, but, um, but something that, that we're still learning more and more about. With that, I might move on to Nita just so that we get to everything, but feel free to keep answering questions in the chat. And if we have time at the end, I'll, we'll go over more questions, but thank you again. Of course. All right, so Nita, I can pull up your slides here. Um, Amy, am I able to use my own slides? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Um, so Dr. Nita Kadir is one of the other co-directors co of the IC Recovery Clinic at UCLA. Um, and she is joining us tonight to talk a little bit more about post-ICU syndrome and some of the challenges in COVID-19. She did her internal medicine re residency at uh, New York University School of Medicine and then her fellowship at New York Presbyterian Hospital. So thank you again for joining us and feel free to get started. All right, uh, thank you everybody. Um, can you all see my screen? Nina, yes, we could see your screen while you were in presentation mode. All right, great. So we started our, um, we started our post ICU clinic here at UCLA earlier this year, kind of just in time for COVID. Um, it's been an, an incredibly rewarding experience, so I'm excited to be talking to you guys today. So um, we, you heard a little about um, you know, risk factors for post-ICU syndrome um, from Kristen. So things like delirium, sedation, mechanical ventilation, immobility. Um, you know, some of these things uh, are modifiable risk factors. Um, hopefully, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the things you can do in the ICU that, um, that can reduce your incidence of post-ICU syndrome and um, some things we've uh, learned in our post-ICU clinic. So probably many of you guys have heard of the ABCDF bundle. Um, this is a multidisciplinary approach for addressing a lot of these issues. So A is for assess, prevent, and manage pain. Um, so this is something that should ideally be done with a, um, with a validated um, uh, tool. Um, B, both spontaneous awakening and breathing trials. So um, these should be coordinated with your RT and RN, um, protocolized. Um, this has been shown to decrease mortality, length of stay, and uh, number of days on the vent. Um, C is choice of analgesia and sedation. So um, this includes a sedation assessment with a validated tool, like, uh, like the RAS score, for example. Um, your choice of agent, so um, 
and specifically avoiding benzodiazepines when possible because we know they're associated with increased risk of delirium um, and you know level of sedation. Um, so your goal is to keep your patient awake and, and alert as much as you can. D, uh, delirium. Um, so delirium assessment with a validated tool, um, CAM ICU being an example, um, this, it should be done in this manner to avoid missing quiet delirium. And I will tell you, I don't think I truly appreciated how much quiet delirium there was in the ICU until I started seeing post-ICU um, patients in clinic. I've had, I had um, I pretty much every patient I've seen, even those without overt delirium, who are awake, interactive, following commands, even texting on their phones while on the vent, um, had delirium recall um, when we saw them in clinic. Um, so I, I just can't emphasize enough how much of an issue delirium is and how underappreciated it probably is. Um, e is for early mobility and exercise. Um, so, you know, the evidence uh, in terms of mortality benefit is uncertain here, but it, it, this is something recommended by multiple professional societies, including ATS, SCCM, and ACCP, um, with the thought that this may be associated with a decrease in mechanical ventilation days, delirium, and Im improved functional status on discharge. And, f and F is family, so family empowerment and engagement. Um, so what does that mean? That, does, that means don't just engage the family when it is um, time for uh, a goals of care discussion. <laughs> um, engage them on a regular basis, ideally daily. Um, in our ICU, we um, invite family members to listen in on rounds. Um, we update them on plans of care. Um, and I, you know, I, I also try to educate them on the ADAF bundle. Um, I try to give them a job sometimes of reorienting their loved one, um, it gives them something to do. And truly, I think it helps because that's a familiar face and voice and, you know, something that I can't provide. Unfortunately, this has been something that's been limited in the days of COVID. Um, so implementing this bundle, um, as I mentioned, addresses many of these risk factors for PICS. Um, so, you know, these, this is, these, all of these things, they're laborious. They, um, you know, they're not as, I guess, exciting as like a new gadget, like saying like, I put my patient on ECMO or something along those lines. This is a lot of little things that add up together. Um, and, but the, these, these implementing this bundle as a whole is something that, um, that saves lives and improves quality of life. So, this has actually been studied. So the ICU Liberation Collaborative is um, SCCM's QI initiative, which um, as its name may suggest, aims to liberate patients from the harmful effects of pain, delirium, immobility, um, and improve both short and long-term outcomes. Um, so one study that came from this um, published just last within the last year um, looked at the association of um, adherence to the ADA-F bundle with outcomes. Um, this is over 15,000 patients in 68 ICUs, um, and you can see that complete bundle performance improved a number of outcomes. Um, it was associated with decreased risk of death at seven days, next day mechanical ventilation, ICU readmission, location of discharge other than home, uh, among others. So, you know, they also found uh, what was interesting, a dose response relationship. So the more elements, the higher proportion of the A to F bundle that you were able to implement, the more number, the more um, elements in that bundle, the, uh, the, the greater the improvement in outcomes. Um, including ICU discharge, hospital discharge, and um, decreased mortality. Um, so, you know, ideally, you of course want to implement all of these, but as I did say before, this is of course laborious and involves, all, you know, involves your whole team. Um, even if you're able to implement or optimize some of them, that, that can be beneficial. But goal is to uh, implement the entire bundle, of course. So um, that is, you know, what we know already. Um, this, is, this is data that we know already. These are QI initiatives that we already should have in our ICU. So I'm going to go on to talk about um, some things I've noted um, really um, since clinic. I mean, somewhat before uh, we started this clinic, but 
Um, it's been much more in my face since we've had this clinic. Um, so smooth transitions in care are something that are, is also underrated and very important. And I, you know, I didn't discharge patients to home before I came here. I did, I transferred them to the floor. Now, um, you know, now, now we sometimes discharge patients straight to home or, you know, directly to rehab. So I've developed much more of an appreciation for transitions of care since I've um, been in Los Angeles. So medications are a really, really big part of this. Um, so in resuming chronic medications, stopping unnecessary medications, and adjusting medication doses, doses. So all of this sounds very simple, but in reality, it's not done very often. So one study showed high rates of um, discontinuation of chronic medications in ICU patients um, and you know, not resuming them upon discharge. And that they also, the same study found that this may, this discontinuation of chronic medications may be associated with worse long-term outcomes. Um, patients acutely hospitalized frequently are also um, discharged on medications with no known indication. Um, in one study of sepsis survivors, 38% of them did not have medications optimized even after discharge. Um, another very recent study um, in, in, in their cohort, greater than 70% of patients um, were discharged on medications, um, and the indication was not known over 40% of the time. Um, so that's pretty impressively bad. Um, so this is a simple thing that you can do. Ideally, you have a pharmacist who is doing this, but it, even you know, if you don't, you as, as the clinician should be able to do this. Um, this is, um, you know, again, a, a simple thing that's often underrated. Um, in terms of other things to do upon discharge, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy assessment, um, you really want to get a good sense of what the um, mobility, what kind of mobility this patient has. Um, tubes, lines, and devices, again, sounds like something simple and straightforward and obvious, but um, I've had patients come into clinic who um, were on dialysis during their ICU stay, no longer needed dialysis, and still had um, tunneled lines in them with no instructions on how to care for them even. Um, so this is, this is something that, um, again, simple, easy uh, thing that, that really, needs to, really needs close attention. Um, identifying a caregiver, um, another simple thing that's been very um, important for us, this person's often going to be your lifeline to this patient. Um, people leaving the ICU aren't necessarily, you know, going to be in the condition to remember all of the things that you tell them, even if it's written down. Um, so it's, it's, we really try to identify a caregiver and point person for that, per, or for, uh, for after discharge at the time of discharge. Um, it's also important to arrange follow-up before they go home um, or to rehab wherever they're going. Um, this is uh, this includes communicating with the primary care doctor and ensuring you know practical things like can they get to their appointment, um, and then just education about post ICU syndrome in general, like setting expectations. Um, you know, a lot of times we I don't think we truly um, appreciate like what the patient, uh, how much uncertainty this patient has now. Like they went through this near death experience. They have new organ failures that they didn't have before. They are on unfamiliar medications. They're weak. And, you know, they, they really don't have a good sense of what's next. I mean, are they going to go back to work? Are they going to be able to go back home? Are they going to feel the same? Are they eventually going to feel the same way they felt before they came to the, high, to the hospital? Um, many people don't even know that post-ICU post syndrome exists. Even you know, even some of our medical colleagues, not just the not just patients. So education about what post ICU syndrome is and things to expect. So other things that we've learned um, in a post ICU clinic um, is you know how post ICU activities can improve ICU care. So the um, SCCM Thrive Collaborative um, published this recently. Um, they were I interviewed um, providers at um, the Thrive Clinics, um, multiple Thrive Clinics, to 
um, identify the things that these providers felt um, were helpful in the ICU that were facilitated by a post ICU clinic. So one big one is identifying otherwise unseen targets for ICU QI. Um, and I, you know, I, I mentioned before how underrated I, 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 I think this was um, before I started, um, before I started uh, doing post ICU clinic. Um, creating a new role for survivors in the ICU, like being part of a support group or a point person to, for other people who've gone through the same thing. Um, in the COVID era, especially, um, there are, I feel like I've had a lot of patients who want to do this, um, and it means quite a lot to them. Um, inviting ICU providers to the post-ICU program as a learning strategy. Um, challenging the clinician's own understanding of the patient experience. Um, I think the most obvious example to me is the um, delirium recall and even seemingly non-delirious patients. Um, and really improving the morale and meaningfulness of ICU work. So every time I report back to our nursing staff about a patient who had a long, difficult course in the ICU and was able to walk back into clinic, that's, that's incredibly gratifying, um, especially with all the pain and suffering we've been seeing recently. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough how much I feel that that's um, improved morale. So just to give you an example from our own post-ICU clinic. Um, this is a patient, 53-year-old man with a history of hypertension who is admitted to the ICU with uh, COVID-19 pneumonia and severe ARDS. He was intubated for 10 days, um, prone for much of that time, and um, on neuromuscular blockade for some of that time. He was, and, and multiple times during, <laughs> during those 10 days, um, people did not think the, the people did not think he was going to survive. Um, he was discharged from rehab facility and then seen in post ICU clinic six weeks later. So he had a number of issues, um, you know, including dyspnea um, and uh, weakness. But a few things that we we learned from him that we're able to directly feed back into our ICU. Um, one uh, were. Um, one, he had a neuropathy in his right wrist, which was the site of his arterial line. So we, and I've seen this in multiple patients actually since then. So we updated our inpatient ICU guidance to recommend arterial line placement on the patient's non-dominant side when feasible. Um, facial pressure, pressure ulcers from proning. Um, and this is becoming more and more of an issue with, um, with all the COVID ARDS that we've been seeing. So, um, the, this, we discussed this with our inpatient RN team. Our proning protocol was modified. Um, we got some recommendations from our wound care specialists as well. Um, and we've really just been more vigilant about this in general. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned before that many people did not think this patient was going to survive, um, even though in reality he didn't actually have that long of a course of mechanical ventilation, but what he was acutely, severely, severely ill. So he returned home when many thought his illness was not survival. Um, I think it's obvious how that improves morale, but I think um, another thing that is hard to appreciate un until you follow up with these patients is, you know, the, the patient experience. And that can help frame how you discuss expectations and have goals of care discussions in the ICU. You know, if you're able to say to a patient's family member, um, you know, best case scenario, if your loved one is able to avoid complications, um, we would eventually be able to get him off of the ventilator, um, and that would be followed by a course in a re rehabilitation facility to get stronger, and hopefully an eventual return home with likely some level of, um, of uh, disability, likely not going to be exactly the same as they went in, but the degree um, of symptoms that that remains unclear. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty in that statement still, but that is much more, you can paint much more of a picture there than, um, you know, than, than, than just saying like, well, we'll we're gonna try to get him off the vent and we'll 
see if we can help, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see if he survives this hospitalization, um, which is how I think a lot of goals of care discussions are sometimes framed. Um, and the, you know, the day-to-day -day of it um, is not well understood by the patient or the family. Um, and I have, you know, many more examples of uh, how things we've learned in clinic have um, modified our protocols in the ICU, but I think this is an untapped opportunity for QI. Um, so in summary, I think we should, we need to make sure we're implementing the things that we already know work, the A to F bundle, um, and also um, capitalize on post-ICU clinics as a uh, uh, as a place where we can identify new targets for care. Thank you so much. I think that's a great summary of some of the ways that the things we see in follow-up can impact ICU care. Um, a couple of questions that were in the chat that I think Kristen already addressed is um, whether or not there's any data on improving physical therapy and early occupational therapy in the ICU, reducing PICs. Um, I know we have some data that it improves general outcomes, but either one of you feel free to weigh in on reducing other symptoms of post-ICU syndrome. So, you know, I, th I think that um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to really do a, a study that can adequately, you know, show that something decreases post-ICU syndrome because there's so many facets of it. You know, there's cognitive dysfunction, there's weakness, there are other sequelae of critical illness. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that it can, it's been shown to decrease post-ICU syndrome specifically, um, but there is a possible reduction in mechanical ventilation days and delirium, and those things, mechanical ventilation and delirium, are associated with risk of uh, post-ICU syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would also add that just given how intertwined so much of this often is, um, that improving physical function, getting people walking will oftentimes improve the mental health, oftentimes also get the cognitive impairment improved too. And so um, there, there's lots of indirect evidence and a few trials suggesting some benefit um, to which it's something that, um, that really I think when feasible should be done in our ICU patients. Um, one other question was if you see, you're seeing much in the way of vascular events like DVT uh, in patients with COVID, uh, specifically a higher incidence than other ARDS patients. Inpatient, we certainly have been seeing higher rates of uh, VTE. Um, in following these people outpatient, if they didn't have VTE in the hospital, we haven't seen many people who de subsequently developed uh, blood clots after discharge for what that's worth. But, but many of these people, because they had blood clots in the hospital, have come to us on anticoagulation. We had one in our IC recovery clinic who was taking both warfarin and apixaban for his PE that was diagnosed during the hospital stay. So strike one for the ICU pharmacist, but. Medication reconciliation, so underrated. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, in regards to that, I just wanted to throw out a few other common culprits or antipsychotics, um, anticoagula anticoagulation, um, PPIs, H2 blockers. Um, what else? Amiodarone is something I see frequently. <laughs> um, so, you know, you always want to know the indication why anyone's on any medication. Um, but, um, you know, really think about even the stuff you find, you, you tend to think of as probably more benign um, before your patient goes home. Great tips. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think we're um, at about 10 minutes past mark. Um, if the presenters, thank you again for joining and thank you for teaching us a bit more about PICS, especially at your institution. Um, if you have time to hang around and answer any more questions, that's fine. But otherwise, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Amy. Absolutely. And just a reminder from the ATS folks, uh, don't forget to get your CME. Brad, did you come back after intubating that person?
Oh, I see his name, but he might not be there. All right. Well, I think that's it, but thank you guys and uh, have a lovely evening. Bye.